It is the Zach Sang Show. Honored to have back in the studio, Halsey. Hey! Dan and Heather are here too, but it's uh, you, you, <laughs> my focus you, is solely you. on you. Hello. I mean, hey guys. top to bottom with this outfit, let's just take a look here. The shoes. They're like just, them. oh, they're bedazzled. They're also, mm. they look like suede. They're nice. What are they? They look, I mean, they kind of look like they're made of like a, um, a couch in a fancy hotel. Yes. <laughs> they're very pretty. Um, Skin to couch for those. They Good are. Good for you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, is something wrong with that? Sophia Webster. Oh, there we cool. go. Cool. Yes. So, okay, when you're coming up with this outfit today for your promo run, how much work goes into it? Um, usually I just go, does this fit? <laughs> there you go. Cool. I, um, first, I mean, for stuff like today, I usually, like, just throw on what's ever in my closet. If you look at, like, any of the videos of me doing radio interviews over the past, like, two years, yeah. I'm always in, like, a t-shirt. Um... <laughs> Which is funny because uh, I usually like try to get really creative with my outfits, um, but I have like two modes. I have like fashion mode and the opposite of fashion mode. I don't give a crap mode, yeah. whatever. Yeah. Both are you though. Oh, for sure. I also think that like um, when I do red carpets or like performances, I'm usually wearing like as little clothing as possible. <laughs> and it's not, I, you know, and everyone always thinks that there's some like weird agenda in that, but it's really just because I have a lot of tattoos. And when my tattoos are covered up, uh, I just don't feel like myself. So, okay. you know, I wear like, I wear clothing that shows off my tattoos and like all my tattoos are in my arms and like my shoulders and my, ch and my, my ribs and yeah. stuff. So that's why I'm usually dressed like that. Um, and then when I'm not, it's so funny because when I'm not on a red carpet, I'm literally just wearing boys clothes all the time. Um, <laughs> You're a t-shirt type of person, right? I see oh, you sometimes. Yeah. Vintage t-shirt, yeah. like, you know, baggy jean, like, kind of kind of thing. Um, I started working with a stylist, um, and my relationship with her, much like my relationship with, like, other people and my crew, is very collaborative. Mm -hmm. You know, she helps me find the stuff that I really want. Because you know, it's to wear, all but. super unique. Like, I I mean, the, the jacket you're wearing right now looks like a combination of, like, three jackets. <laughs> it, it, it is. You know? I, it, actually, it, it actually is. TJ Maxx <laughs> doesn't sell this. No. Um, it's funny you say that because my first radio visit I ever did, I wore an outfit I bought at TJ Maxx. What? Nice. Yeah. Come on. So, That's the East I Coast in TJ you. Max. Yes. Right? <laughs> I mean, I wasn't signed to a label, and I just put out Ghost, and... Um, a radio station was playing the record independently and they asked me if I'd come in and do a visit and I was like, sure. And then I was like, oh my God, what does that mean? <laughs> like, what do I do? What what do I wear? <laughs> Is there going to be people? I'd never been in a radio station before. I was still under the impression that every radio host was as good looking as their voice sounds. <laughs> Some are. Obviously Some are. Not. Obviously, this crew <laughs> is, is killing it. That's why you guys do video as well. Yes, thank you. Know, you. That's I'm not why that you, ashamed. <laughs> you guys do video as well. But, you know, I was just like, I didn't know any better. Um, mm -hmm. And so I, I, was, I was like, oh my gosh, I need something to wear. So I went to TJ Maxx and I bought a little black romper and I Ooh. still have it. We were just talking about rompers before. Sorry. They make them for men now. I saw. And you know what's funny is I'm seeing a lot of people online being like, oh, like, guys, if you love yourself, don't wear this romper. And I'm like, pfft. Let them wear whatever they want. That, if you right? want to wear a romper, let them rock a romper. I, I don't mean, know. That's what I'm saying. And that's what I'm trying to convince Heather of, because I really want to wear one. Well, men have, men are constantly so obnoxious about what women wear. Like, oh, we don't like high-waisted pants, and like we don't like baggy jeans, and we Every don't like red lipstick, thing. and blah, 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 blah. You know what I mean? Like, I remember when high-waisted jeans came back into fashion and like every guy I knew was like oh you're wearing mom jeans mom jeans mom jeans and it was like a whole thing and it's like well let us wear whatever we want to wear I think it should go both ways I right. do by well, the way now if your your lady isn't wearing the high-waisted jeans then she's not cool and hipster she's enough not in fashion yeah she's not in have guys had things to say about your buzzed head Oh my gosh, of course. <laughs> <laughs> of course. You're great with it. It was my, awesome. My uh I shaving my head was the best thing I ever did because it made me officially put down the phone and stop looking at the comments. Because as soon as I saw people being like, Halsey, I'm not gonna be your fan again until you grow your hair back out, that's oh. when I was like, Well, th 
I'm not going to listen. This is yeah, stupid. Right. <laughs> like, but also, like, you don't want somebody like that consuming your art. Oh, or maybe good you riddance. Do, or maybe you yeah. do because your music can change them. I don't know. Good riddance. Good riddance. But I've also had a lot of people tell me that I've changed their perspective about their peers or, mm. you know, their taste or the things that they thought they may or may not have been interested in. Because I've had a lot of, like, you know, a lot of a lot of guys on the internet who traditionally probably have a type, mm -hmm. you know, like a sports illustrated, you know, Ooh. type. Um and uh and, and who have reached out and been like, I never thought that I would be into a girl with a shaved head, but I you rock and it that's shows cool. All, it shows right. off your face. You have a great yes. face. Thank you very much. <laughs> Aww, I made it myself. <laughs> well, because <laughs> <laughs> when you had blue hair, you know, that's distracting, but now yeah. you, you focus on this. Yeah. I don't think I could ever grow my hair back out. You don't want to. I don't know. I don't think it's me. I like the options. I like being able to wear wigs and yeah. like, you know, do whatever. That's the weird thing. Most of my, most of my partners, they don't have a problem with the shaved head, but I've had a lot of partners get weirded out by me having wigs. Because like, you know, I think that a lot of people are not equipped to deal with someone coming home after a long day and climbing into bed and taking off a wig and being in a wig cap. <laughs> All right. Because, you know, you look at that and sometimes then you're like, Oh my goodness. <laughs> what is the wig linked to? Is it you wanting to be access different versions of you, feeling you can hide behind a wig and then at the end of the day come back to yourself? Yes and no. I think that so much of my music is so visual yeah. and I'm so often portraying like characters um, and they're character versions of me, you know what I mean? Um, so I think the wigs kind of let me like fade in and out of that mm -hmm. like for the now or never music video i brought the blue wig back um and then i chopped all my hair off at the end of the video to kind of like demonstrate a sort of like a growth or a passage you know because a lot of my fans did say to me that they felt like um they felt like i had changed you know when i when i changed my hair and so i was really eager to show them a new style of music and a new style of video but you know me with my old blue hair and to be like it's not. I'm not that different after all. Mm -hmm. If I put the wig back on, I you know I elicit the same response in yeah. me that I used to. Just because I cut my hair doesn't mean that anything about me has changed. I still stand for the same things. My music still has the same you know dignity and uh, and authenticity. And oh, guys, all I did was cut my hair. Right? And it's, <laughs> it's crazy though because hair is such a hair is such a big deal. It's defining. It is such a big deal. It really is. I know and and, and for 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 all types of people. Yeah. It's it's a it's a big deal. You know, like I grew up in a mixed race household and you know, one of the things that my mom really struggled with when I was a kid is cuz my mom's white and I got my father's hair. So my hair was really 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 curly when I was a kid. Um and so I needed to have it like braided or styled and she didn't even know what to do with it. And she'd so show up to salons that specialized in like black hair. And she's this white woman walking in with this, you know, this light skinned baby. And people were like, what are you doing? <laughs> you know, and it made her feel like really alienated and confused. And like she wasn't, you know, wow. doing a good enough job as a mom that she couldn't like help me with that. Hair is like a big deal for women of color, you know, because it like it people consider like straight long hair yeah. to be beautiful you know so women that don't have that hair really struggle hairs are really really it's it's a, it's an issue in the trans community because if you know if you're a trans guy and you don't have short hair or you're a trans woman and you don't have long hair you know those are so such identifiers and they can alienate you as well hair is such a big deal it's crazy that's why i got rid of all of mine it's good. <laughs> rid of it. It, it, but it, it, it's beautiful and works, and it is like you're accent. You're going into a new chapter a little bit. Same yeah. you, mm -hmm. just different, different part of you. Yeah, it also definitely weeds people out for sure. I cut the first time I ever cut my hair off was in high school. I cut all my hair off my s junior year of high school, and people were mean. People were really mean. I grew up in a in a in a in the city when I was a kid, and then I moved kind of to like a more rural part yeah. of New Jersey, and um, people were mean about me having short hair, and they called me slurs, and they were, you know, really terrible about it. Um, and, 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 you know, and that was a great process for me because it made me realize if someone doesn't want to be my friend or doesn't want to talk to me or is embarrassed Based on your because hair. I cut my hair, yeah. I don't want to be friends with that person anyway. Yeah, who you are got you? It. Yeah, and that's extended into, like, you know, this portion of my project where, like, when I get on stage and I have a bald head <laughs> and, you know, someone in the audience is like, ugh, 
and they don't want to listen. Like, you know, if I'm playing like yeah. a festival or something and someone like doesn't want to listen or they don't want to give me a chance because of it, I don't want you to be a fan of mine anyway because yeah. that means you're probably not even going to understand, you know, wh what my music is supposed to mean or my message or, you know, you're not going to be a, a, a healthy part of my, my fan community anyway if that's how you judge people, you know. Hopeless Fountain Kingdom. It yes. is your second album. Yeah. It's hitting June 2nd. Yes. And... Two two songs out from the album so far, right? Mm -hmm. We got Now or Never and we have Eyes Closed. Mm -hmm. Now or Never is Romeo and Juliet. Yeah. But it's also the start of something. Yeah. I mean, the, the record is uh, is definitely in in hal true Halsey fashion and it's conceptual. Yeah. Um, and I definitely think that I've done a much better, better job of that this time around. Um, when I wrote Badlands, the concept was really executed in the live show in the visuals and the merchandise and the events and it didn't exist so much within the record itself it kind of existed in what we created around the record got it um but it was also my first album and i was 19 mm -hmm. and i was like i want to make a concept album and no one told me hey that's going to be hard <laughs> you, know, you know i didn't know any i didn't know any better um but i learned a lot in, in the whole process you know because when i wrote the when i wrote badlands all i was thinking about was badlands mm -hmm. i wasn't thinking about the tour i wasn't yeah. thinking about the merch i wasn't thinking about any of that and now that I've you know toured forever I have the foresight to to see you know how my record is going to not just exist in the first listen for someone but how it's going to grow and what it's going to mean because a record cycle lasts like two years yes that album is going to change and grow and mean different things and as my life change and as I adapt to it you know the record's going to grow and so I tried to be pretty concise with the the concept this time it's a it's a Romeo and Juliet story so the whole thing that's what I was really yeah I, you know because it looked like the whole each song could be representative of a different movie but mm -hmm. so the whole thing tells the Romeo and Juliet story yeah and the records in chronological order okay as oh, well cool. so yeah. when when um when the whole thing's out you know from top to bottom it tells a story and it does it in in the vein of Romeo and Juliet where the first song or the intro to the record yeah. is a pro is a prologue in the, in the sense that um the first two songs on the record actually because the first one's kind of like an intro it's not really a song um they tell you what's going to happen before you even get started so the cool thing about Romeo and Juliet is um you know Shakespeare gives a prologue and he says you know these people are going to die yeah but that doesn't stop you from wanting to hear the story anyway exactly. even though you yeah. know the ending uh -huh. and that's really really cool a really cool literary tool that he uses telling you the ending before he even starts the story and so I've done the same you know with the record so uh, how did you how did you uh, get this all accomplished right where did you start <laughs> did you start from the first song and work your way down did you have certain songs that and then you built it and added to it well you know the concept is uh is so special to me because it i, I was living it yeah i was going through a really prolonged breakup a get back together breakup get back together breakup get back together breakup kind of breakup um with someone that i had been with for a really long time and someone who had kind of grown with me and ironically enough, someone who um, I was making music with. Um, so it can get messy. Yeah, and so in this process, when when uh, when I got off of tour in September, I had just put out I just put out Closer, uh -huh. and uh, Closer was just starting to kind of connect with people. And so I was supposed to have all this time off to write a record, and instead, the Chainsmokers and I were doing the VMAs, the yeah. AMAs, whatever you know what I mean, like doing performances for. The song and visiting people and stuff and, and 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 it was incredible. The record was, I mean, it was a game changer. It was a it very was. big song. <laughs> yes, yes. you know, I'm the biggest one to actually. Say the least. But, yeah. Yeah. but it's hard. To, I mean, when you're trying to write a record, you know, yeah, that takes focus and dedication. I also just got off of tour and I'd been giving so much of myself to the world for two years, yeah, and now right. here I am, like barely hanging on, you know, trying to you know, go promote the song and also try to think about my record. And I just felt so like, so dead in the eyes. Is know? the relationship so, like, happening Ooh. while that's all going on? Yeah. Wow. And so, um, so I, uh, I started watching Baz Luhrmann's Romeo and Juliet uh -huh. and I got obsessed. I got obsessed. I watched, I was watching it every day. I downloaded it to my phone so I could watch it in the back of Ubers. Like I was, <laughs> I was out of my mind obsessed what? and I couldn't figure out why. I was just gonna say, what was it? I couldn't figure out why. And then one day I was starting my writing sessions for my, for my record. And I did my first session. It was a Ricky Reed cool. with a wallpaper who I love. And, um, and we got in, in the studio and I wrote the first song on the album and it's a song called a hundred letters. And in that song, I tell the story of the relationship 
um, from start to finish, and I give away the ending, like the prologue, like I said. And then I went, oh, my God. I love Romeo and Juliet because I feel like I'm living it. Like I'm going through this relationship where I feel like a version of myself and a version of himself are dying for the sake of wanting, to, you know, to make our love work. Yeah. And and then that song was a success. Wow. I, I've knocked that one out of the park in a day. It was great. And then I, I started trying to write other music, and I realized I don't know what to write about. <laughs> I don't know what to write about. I... I, I I don't know who I am. I don't know what to say. I have nothing left to say. I had, I was angry and I had a message on Badlands, you know? Yeah. And then in, in starting this new record and going through this breakup, I realized how much of my identity I had given to my partner. And, you know, it was one of those things where I would wake up in the morning in my empty house, which I hadn't done in years. Mm -hmm. And I go and I take a shower and it's quiet and I'm by myself and... I'd go back in my room and I'd stand in front of my closet and I'd think, well, God, what do I wear hmm. when he's not looking over my shoulder and I'm not thinking about what, what, what's going to make him happy that I put on, what's going to make him find me attractive, what's going to make him like me, you know, what, who am I when I'm not, because, you know, That's... who am I when who I am is not defined by the gaze of another person. You know, because who, who you are when you're in a relationship is defined by, is reflected in the way your partner sees you or in the way your partner, yeah. you know, acts towards you sometimes, um, which is a very toxic thing. That's not a, a good thing. But, and so I found myself being like, who am I when I'm not taking his opinion into account all the time? What do I want to eat? What do I want to watch? What music do I like? You know what I mean? Like, what you do I want to do? I didn't even know who I was. And so then... When I realized that and then I made the connection to Romeo and Juliet, it was very clear what the record should be about and, and how to write it. Um, so I wrote it as this kind of like cinematic, like, you know, hi hyperbole of the of the relationship. And it's really cool. There's a lot of moments where like, I say it's like when you're a kid and you climb a tree, like smash cut to like, you're on top of a mountain <laughs> and you're wearing a superhero cape and the clouds are beneath you and like smash cut back to you being like four feet off the ground. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know what I mean? So yeah, that's yeah, kind of yeah. like what this album is in, 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 in parallel to my relationship where like we were fighting in the backseat of a taxi cab and then I would write a song and I'd say that we were fist fighting in the limousine. <laughs> You know, so it's like this, like, uh... That's fu I mean, you, you're kind of glamorizing and adding extra drama. Yeah, it's, to what, you know... What is already pretty dramatic and heavy. Yeah, it's the TV TV movie version of a very normal breakup. Nice. You know? So I was confused at first because I was watching interviews, but it's kind of... This whole album is your story mm -hmm. based off another story in a way? It's my story in the style of another story. Okay. So, so it's my relationship if Baz Luhrmann wrote it. Is it like the soundtrack to the story? Yeah. Got so, it. Got and, and there's it. all these videos and all this stuff. So it's yeah. like, because one of the things I loved about Baz Luhrmann, you know, in his work, Great Gatsby, Moulin Rouge, Come you on. know, Romeo and Juliet, is he is he can take a classic story, a timeless story, and he can retell it in a way that is modern, in mm -hmm. a way that's, you know, exciting and romantic. And the language of film and the language of music are not all that different. They're really not. It's about taking basic human emotions and making them, you know, unique and personal while still maintaining their their, their versatility mm -hmm. and their universal, you know, element. So I did what any normal 22-year-old girl going through a breakup would do, and I called Baz Luhrmann. Obviously, <laughs> <Of> yes. <laughs> Same. <laughs> and, uh, and I asked him if he would... <laughs> but, <laughs> can't even get through that. <laughs> no, but I did, actually. I'm sure you did. And I yeah. asked him if he would get brunch with me. And we got brunch, and I was like, listen, I'm obsessed with your movie. I'm going through this breakup. I feel like I'm living this. What, what you know, talk to me. Talk to me. And what does he say? Because, like, you directed the, the music video. Does he guide you visually through all the songs? Is he going to be directing any of the videos? No, I think we'd like to collaborate visually at some point. I'd yeah. love to do some sort of, like, big concert event and have him design cool. this, the set and I the costumes you. and everything. Yeah. Um, you know, almost like a Broadway adaptation. Not Broadway, but, like, you know, a Broadway-style adaptation yeah. for a concert. Um but yeah, I sat with him. We talked to him. We talked about that. We talked about the language of film and the language of music. And we talked about retelling a classic story because Romeo and Juliet is um, 
It's as old as the is the institution of marriage. Yeah, it was around before Shakespeare even wrote it. Exactly. So before Shakespeare wrote Romeo and Juliet, it was an Italian opera. And then before it was an Italian opera, it was the Greek myth of Orpheus. And Orpheus is the son of a, of a god and a muse, and he falls in love, and uh, his wife dies on their wedding night before they can consummate their love. It's really funny how much of the Greek myths are motivated by wanting to have sex. Um, <laughs> a majority I of mean, them? <laughs> Orpheus literally, literally dove into the underworld to retrieve his wife because he wanted to sleep with her so badly. Um, <laughs> it's all to get right. it in. It's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, um, By the way, like, that still exists today, yeah. you know? I mean, honestly, it's like... It, human it's like, nature was defined all the way back then. It's like the my parents aren't home meme. Like, that's what, <laughs> that's what it turns into. It's like Hades, Hades isn't home. Um, but, um, so he, he he rides through the river of Styx and he dives into the underworld to retrieve his wife. And the, the way he can do so is because Orpheus has a voice so powerful that it can make the earth move. It can move soil. It can move rock. So he dives into the underworld and he goes to retrieve his wife. And Hades says, you can have her back on two conditions. One is you sing for me so I can see what all the fuss is about. Um, because Hades was, in fact, as sarcastic as he was portrayed in the Disney version of her. Um, but, um, and he says, all right, listen, if you sing for me so I can see what all the fuss is about, I'll let you have her. But when you take her, you have to go back into the mortal world and you can't look back. Don't look at her. No matter how much she cries, no matter anything, you can't tell her about your plan. You can't look at her. So he sings for Hades and melts his cold, dead heart uh -huh. and then gets his wife. And they're riding back into the mortal world. And as they're about to break into the light, his wife is crying. Orpheus, why won't you look at me? You're going to leave me here. You don't love me. Why won't you look at me, please? Like, you don't even love me. And he breaks down and he turns away. And he looks at her too soon before they're into the mortal world. And she's swept away forever. Oh. And he never gets her back. Um, and that's pretty much, that evolved over time into the story of Romeo and Juliet, which evolved into Baz Luhrmann's Romeo and Juliet with Leonardo DiCaprio, which has evolved now into my record. Hopeless somehow. Fountain Kingdom. Yeah. yeah there you go. <laughs> Is there a real fountain? Yeah, it's in Brooklyn. It's off the L train, right? It is. It's on the Halsey stop. You're, did, did there's you're, a there's a fountain off the Halsey stop yeah. called the Hopeless Fountain. Did Kingdom. your boyfriend make it for you? Um, someone I know made it for me, uh, but so, not my boyfriend. Just um, a lover or just a friend? So someone I've known for a really really long time that I have like a tremendous amount of like creative synchronicity with. Okay. Um, someone because Hopeless Fountain Kingdom isn't new. My fans know that. The, there's been like clues about the record and like indications of it Dude. all over my social media. You tweeted back to about like, it 2014. 2014. You tweeted simply the kingdom. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. I mean, you've had this like when at what point in life did you realize that this album was going to be a thing? The Hopeless Fountain Kingdom has always represented this kind of love conquers all, you know, parallel universe to me. Okay. And I wasn't ready to write about it until I had been in love. And wow. then I was in love, and then I was like, all right, cool. Like, I'm ready to go there now. I'm ready to show people what this means. Um, How was love defined to you? Was it the fact that you couldn't do anything without this person? No, that's not love. That's bad. <laughs> that is. So, I thought that was love, yeah. but that is not love. That is bad. Um, you know, the thing for me was feeling like I would literally die for someone. That's what I thought it meant to be. That's what I thought it meant to be in love. And then I've learned since then that wanting to die for someone is not being in love with them. Wanting to live for someone is is is, is, is being in love. You know what I mean? Like wanting to, you know, love is a, is supposed to be is supposed to be a it's a luxury. You know, love love exists in many forms, and um, the most important love that I've learned is to have love for yourself because if you don't have love and it's so simple everyone tells you all the time love yourself first love yourself first love yourself first yeah. to be loved um but that's a hard thing to do you, mm -hmm. you got, you, somebody needs to push you you know thing to do yeah and you know especially you know i had gone through all these changes and i'm never alone i'm never alone i have an assistant, a manager, a security guy, a boyfriend, a girlfriend, a whatever, a band, you know. Yeah. I'm always with someone. Always. My best friend and my assistant, Peyton, she lives in my house. So I am always with someone. I'm always with someone for safety reasons, yeah. you know, because people, I can't, like, you know, there's some things that I just simply can't do by, by myself. I'm always with someone because I'm always working, so yeah. I always need to be someone around, you know, doing emails and approvals and stuff like that. And so... What I did when I broke up with this when this person I broke up was I was like, I need to spend time alone. And I sat in my room and I remember I remember one night 
this is gonna sound actually insane I but I'm excited I remember one night being alone shortly after the breakup and sitting in my room and I have like this wall of mirrors across from my bed mm-hmm. and I remember sitting and like looking in the mirror and being like what like wh- who is that like I remember and I sat there and so I got off my bed and I, I crawled across the carpet and I sat down in front of the mirror and for like 30 minutes I just like made faces at myself in the mirror alone like made all these different expressions, like sad and happy and like showed my teeth and like looked at myself. And you know, I had this moment where the last time I was alone, I had long brown hair and I lived in New Jersey and I had hmm. a mom and a dad and two little brothers. Different and, world around you. know, you. Yeah, and now all of a sudden I'm looking at myself and I have short hair and I'm in this house in California and there was this man in my life who's now not anymore and I'm making all these faces at myself in the mirror and I just remember sitting there like, I felt like I was on drugs, I was like, who, what do you like? I didn't even I didn't even recognize like I didn't connect. I didn't look at my face and think that's me. I was looking at my face and thinking like that's a nose and like that's skin and like that's a face, but like feeling no attachment to the person I was looking at. And I was like, this is bad. This is really yeah. bad. And so then I started spending time alone and I started being like, you know, because if you if you don't spend time with yourself, then you don't know yourself, and yeah. if you don't know yourself, you can't love yourself. And it's just like this vicious cycle of you know. Beautifully said relationships you know you're getting yourself is scary yeah oh yeah looking looking in the mirror and 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 feeling like it's a sack of skin in front of you and that you have no personal connection to the image you're looking at is that's when you've reached a point of okay you need to go figure out who you are and you rebuilt that connection just through spending time alone yeah i did i did i started doing stuff i used to like to do reading painting you know listening and, and it was it was such little changes too it was little changes it was like you know i used to get up in the morning shower as quick as i can and then and get out the door and go to you know an interview or like whatever it is i had to do and now i started waking up a little bit earlier putting on some music while i was in the shower listening to yeah. a playlist you know like changing my mood thinking giving myself choices because the more choices I made, the more I could understand myself. Choices. Instead of just saying, yeah, yeah, that's fine, I'll eat whatever. Yeah, yeah, I'll listen to whatever. Yeah, yeah, I'll go whatever. I started giving myself choices. What song do you want to put on this morning, <laughs> Ashley? What do you want to eat for breakfast, Ashley? You have an hour by yourself at home. What do you want to do? Are you going to paint your toenails? Are you going to do a face mask? Are you going to watch an episode <laughs> of Californication? Like, what are you going to do? I started giving myself choices. And it really made me, like, reconnect with myself. Such simple and, things. Yeah. But they really make what a big difference. What is quality time in your yeah. brain with no, yourself? Agreed, yeah. But, you know, I didn't realize, like, how, nor- like, people I know that have, like, different lifestyles than me, I guess. Like, my brothers and stuff. Like, my, I have a, a 19-year-old brother and a 12-year-old brother. Mm-hmm. And, like, I remember talking to my 19-year-old brother about this. And he was like, duh. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like, it seems simple. And I was like, okay, cool. My, my brother who's a freshman in college understands this concept and I don't you know but it is really I guess it is really simple but it's easy to, but when you have so much going on you yeah. lose track of it all also when you give so much of yourself for the sake of wanting to help another person or wanting to you know support another person mm-hmm. or encourage another person Training. you know that can be hard there's a lyric on my album um there's a there's a series of lyrics I'm, I can't believe I'm giving away right now but um in a song called devil in me um uh, which is about uh, finding yourself after after a relationship and it's called devil in me because it's it's kind of tongue-in-cheek it's about me like you know waking up the devil in me um, which is bringing myself because that's what like the person I was with used to call yeah. my real personality would like refer to like my no not not actually okay. you know what I'm saying would think of like you know that person would probably think of my real personality as like the bad parts of me uh-huh. the parts that are loud the parts that are you know obnoxious or you know whatever like that kind of stuff and so there's a there's a series of lyrics in the song and I say I say um um I won't take anyone down if I crawl tonight um on but I won't take anyone down if I crawl tonight but I let everyone down when I change in size and I went tumbling down trying to reach your height because I scream too loud when I speak my mind and the, those lyrics are about that part that says, I let everyone down when I change in size. Is about me, you know, adjusting myself, trying to fit this person. The mold. And realizing I'm letting everyone around me down. And so I says, I won't take anyone down if I crawl tonight. Um, you know, trying to get low, trying wow. to make myself smaller, trying to be, you know, the size that this person probably wanted me to be. Um, and, and so that was like the big wake up call. Where does that lyric get created? 
Um, are you in the studio? Or are you just going through something and you're just processing? So yeah, I mean, I sometimes, sometimes like uh, like sounds will sounds have like a personality okay. like melodies sometimes have a personality that kind of can lead you to the right words uh -huh. um like a, a melody can be melancholy and then it can make you think of like you know a, a more sad a more reserved a calmer mm -hmm. lyric or a melody can can be jumpy or you know energetic and then it can lead you to a more confident lyric um and in that particular song i i wrote it with sia oh cool oh, wow. um and i only did two two real co-writes on the album um, with other writers, okay. and it was Sia and The Weeknd. Yes. I did Eyes Closed with Abel, and I did Devil and Me with Sia. And we were in the studio, and she was just, in in, 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 in these co-writes, they come up with melody, I write lyric, um, because they're two artists whose melodies I love. The, and that, they're known for their lyrics, they're, but their the, melodies are amazing. The melodies are, are, are incredible, and so, you know, and also I just, I have to write my own lyrics, you know? It, it's, it's you. It's just how, I, just, I can't sing something someone else wrote. Um, and so I'm in the studio with Sia, who is awesome, by the way, like the coolest, coolest person in the world. Um, like so nice, beautiful. I've stalked funny. her interviews. She looks yeah. like, oh, come on, I can't. She's even. great. She's also like, she's so cool. She's got this like fit body. She's like working hard. <laughs> like, you know, she's like so smart and funny and nice. But also and, real as ever. You yeah. Know? Like, oh yeah. I mean, she, it was like, we'd known each other forever when I, when I jumped in. Um, but, uh. She was kind of like sing, humming these melodies in the studio, <clears throat> and her voice was cracking and like whining, and she sounded so vulnerable and so like regretful, and that kind of those lyrics were the first thing that came to my mind. Wow! Oh, wow. Like listening to her kind of like, and she wasn't saying any words. It was you just know? She all was just, humming. Yeah, she was just like kind of wailing a little bit, and I was like, oh, and it was like you know, it just made sense. It was just there. Sometimes like. You know, like some, a really good baker can look at like a bunch of ingredients and a, like a good chef can look in a fridge and see a meal. And figure it out, yes. They just see a meal. And you, you're standing behind them like, what are you looking at, buddy? We got, <laughs> we got, we got mustard. Yeah, right. <laughs> we got mustard, pickles, and like, you some know. Sausage. Yeah, and like and some orange juice. Like, but what are you thinking about? <laughs> yeah, right. Um, and songwriting can be very much the same. Where like you're in a mood, you're with a person, there's a certain sound. It's a drum, it's a piano, it's something. And like all those parts together, it's like, I always say it's like someone takes a spitball gun mm -hmm. and goes, and just spits the song right into my ear. And I go, okay. And then it's up to me to figure out how to make it happen. Wow. You know? Um, Do you get some pieces and you yeah. have to assemble from there? Yeah. Now, Lauren Haregi from Fifth Harmony is on the album. How is yeah. it working with her? So I, I wrote a song called Strangers. Um, I wrote a love song. Um, and it's uh, it's kind of at a point in the album uh, narratively, it's a point in the album. It's a meet scene. It's like a Romeo and Juliet kind of like um, cause it's called Strangers, you know. And if you've seen the film or if you're familiar with the play, you know that they meet at this like event, this like masquerade, and yeah. they're like ducking each other, and they're strangers, but they're love at first sight kind of thing. What kind of party is it here? Um, well. <laughs> It's like a crazy house party at my house, <laughs> um, which I explain in two other songs. I explain, I talk about, the, I set up the house party in Alone and Heaven and Hiding. Okay. And then I talk about the meet in Strangers. All connected. Um, yeah. So it's all, like I said, this like storyline and Heaven and Hiding and Alone are cool because they're two character perspectives of the same party. It's that's, Romeo's perspective and Juliet's perspective. Oh, that's awesome. Um, so that's really, really cool. Um, but in Strangers, I wrote this, this, this song that narratively is about the meet scene, but is actually about um is actually me reflecting on another relationship I had been in trying to move on from from this one got it um and it's uh it's about it's so and it, it's the first song there's there's a couple on the record but this is the first song that I ever wrote where I openly used female pronouns and I had I have songs on Badlands that are about you know women that I've been with, but mm -hmm. I wasn't really I was 19 and it was my first record and I tried to keep it. I also really tried to keep Badlands gender neutral yeah. or like and that's why I think I I got I found myself a lot of male fans from that record um, because I wasn't singing about he or she or anything. I kept it pretty Nuch. pretty neutral. But on this one, I kind of go there. Um, and I wrote this song and with I, a chick. Does it, does the gender change from song to song? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It. So like there's some songs that have he's, some songs that have she's um, on the record, but it's because 
it's funny because for me, I'm singing about different relationships I've been in, but in the record, it just looks like it's different characters singing about each oh. other. You know what I mean? So when I'm singing about like a girl I dated, it looks like, you know, um, it looks like a male character singing about a female character, yeah. or like you know, in the in the essence of the story. Got it. Um, but um, I wrote this song, and I it's kind of Stevie Nicks, it's kind of Pat Benatar, cool. kind of Daft Punk. Okay. It's really it's so like it's okay. all over the place. Let me explain. Yeah. A little bit of everything. Let me explain. <laughs> <laughs> the the lyric and the the confidence are Pat Benatar. Mm -hmm. The harmonies and the the duet in the chorus are Stevie Nicks. Like the idea cool. of like the Fleetwood Mac kind of like harmonic, um, two people singing at once like at, duet style at each other or at once. At, at, well, at once. Got it. Um, we go back and forth in the verses, but um. And then the drums are, and the drums and the the synths are like super French. It's like very Daft Punk, very Starboy. Like, um, I like that breakdown. Yeah, and so and, and it, something wasn't right. I was like, something's not believable. Something's not, you know, me just singing the song isn't enough. Like, I need it to be more real. And uh, Lauren is a friend of mine, and she's openly bisexual, mm -hmm. and so am I. Um, and our fans, really, this this past year have just really expressed just so much support and so much love and an and indication that they just relate to us and they're happy to have us being outspoken about it and I was thinking to myself if I want this song to be believable it needs to be real so I'm not going to put a girl on the song to sing th uh, who's straight yeah. mm -hmm. I'm just not going to do it you know so I reached out to Lauren and she came in and she cut the vocal and it sounds awesome. Our voices sound really cool together because we both have like really raspy voices. Mine's a little more like delicate than hers. Hers is like really powerful and like big and raspy and mine's kind of like light and raspy. Um, but it's really cool. And I just love that Lauren and I are two women who have like a mainstream pop presence doing a love song for the LGBT community. I think the world needs cool. it. And I, I think the time is now more than ever. And I think radio of. should embrace it too. It really is. And, I, and I'm going to be real over, over the last couple of years, there's been songs that have come out, right. That have been, mm -hmm. you know, fancy Haygood had a song with Ariana and Megan Trainor one time, boys of the summer or something. Mm -hmm. And nobody, it, it was ignored. It was completely mm -hmm. ignored. Right. So th 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 these records are needed because the ones in the past have been totally just brushed over. Mm -hmm. Right. Also, not in a, there's, but there's been a, it's very rare to see it from a female perspective. Yes. Troy Sivan is a really Never. good friend of mine. I love him. I think that his presence in pop culture is so necessary, mm -hmm. so vital. Sam Smith obviously made waves making records that people, records that were so human and so amazing and emotional that it didn't matter what your sexuality was. Yes. You just identified with what he was singing, you know? And that's kind of what I wanted to do with Strangers. There's not one point in Strangers where I'm like, and we're girls and we're singing and, <laughs> and you should love us even like you it's know love. you should yeah. accept us like it's not about that it's just a love song yes mm -hmm. it's not it at no point in the song does it make a point to say that it's a it's a gay love song it's it just a love song yeah that happens to use same-sex pronouns that's, like and that's what it should be you should know? always be and also yeah. i think that's what the world wants right yeah. because y if you really want to have impact don't dress it up and you know yeah. attach giant stereotypes or make stereotypes as clear as day yeah you know yeah. make it as real yeah i mean make it make it just make, like every other song make it so that you know you can listen and it's your two minutes and 30 seconds in and then you go oh she's been saying she the whole time yeah. you know like that's like it should just be like un, un, unthinkable um it was really cool having some features on this record because i've never had features of my own before i've always been a feature mm -hmm. you know um and uh and by the way that's a cool thing as an artist right oh it's great you know? it's really cool to and also to have your peers be like of course i want to be a part of your project you know it's like really validating it's mm -hmm. awesome i picked three features on this album Ew. and i i chose them very carefully i have cashmere cat wow okay. i have quavo sweet and lauren Haregi. nice and the reason i did that is because this record kind of has a little bit more of an urban r&b element to it so I chose three features as kind of like representatives from the three genre worlds that I've been a part of. Yeah. So Cashmere Cat kind of represents this like alternative electronic genre. Quavo represents this urban genre and Lauren represents this pop genre, which is kind of where I, if I had three legs, I'd have one in every <laughs> genre. You know what I mean? When, when you get into the studio with Cashmere Cat, like what, what do you want out of that session? Like, do, mean, you, do you have a sound in your head? Magnus is like, <laughs> he's so shy. He's a genius. He's so shy and he's so funny. Um, 
and I love him. I really love him so much. Um, but he he did production on a couple of songs on the record. Okay. But the reason I chose to put him as a feature on one of the songs was because he does. It's hard to explain without having the song, but he does his cashmere cat thing where it's like this whiny choir kind of howling vocal. Uh-huh. Um, and um, and in a and he did does it in, a, in like a call and response fashion to like a verse that I put on a song. And uh, it sounded almost like he, it almost sounded like he, him doing a like him doing a verse, like instrumental. It sounds like another language. Like it sounds like he's a character speaking another language on the song, like an alien language, like singing back to me through the synthesizer. It's cool. What? And so I was like, I need to make yeah. him a feature because it's like he has his own voice. It's him. And um, you know, the characters every every feature kind of serves as like a as a Shakespearean like operatic character. So like, you know, Lauren joins as an antagonist. Quavo is kind of like a third party narrator mm-hmm. in a weird way, where like in the song that he's on. Um, it's almost like he's speaking to my ex and there's like a moment in the in the verse where he says to him Like I'm, I'm gonna paraphrase this so I'm not giving too much away But he okay. pretty much says if you treated her right she wouldn't complain like pretty much yeah. So it's almost like he's like a third-party character saying like a Mercutio or a Tibble yes. saying yeah. saying to him like what are you doing? Yeah, you know kind of thing kind of situation like a he's he almost serves as like a Benvolio actually is what he serves as um and so, you know, there's there's so many different moments and then there's there's chorus moments where you have like, you know, where Sh- Shakespeare utilizes a choir as an omniscient third party narrator and we kind of not narrator and we kind of do the same thing um, uh, on the on the record. But it's not too theatrical. It's still a pop album. You know what I mean? It's mm-hmm. experimental, but it's a pop album. But there's a movie here, too. Yeah. Yeah. In a, in a, in a, I mean, I've always tried to, I mean, every record I've ever made has been inspired by a director. Uh-huh. Every single one. Every People ask me all the time. Like, Halsey, who are your musical influences? And I'm like, uh, <laughs> damn. Uh, I mean, I have a couple. I love The Weeknd. He's yeah. really inspired me. And the reason the reason he inspired me is from his record, Kissland. Kissland is probably the least commercially known of his albums. Yeah. And um, in a way, it's like a concept record. And it... it uh, it tells you know this story, and if I, if I may be incorrect, I hope I'm not. Um, but I think he wrote it while he was touring in Asia, mm-hmm. um, and there's you know all these laws about drug usage and like all this stuff, and it's like a really it was a really scary environment for him, and so the record is peppered with these like screams and these like horror movie shrieks and like dogs barking and moans and this kind of like really theatrical uh, style of production, and I heard it and was like this is, sounds like a movie. And then I was like, oh, <laughs> it's connected. It can- Wait, that's what I want to do. <laughs> um, you know, so he's been a, he's been a huge influence and I'm really happy to have him as a friend as well. Um, you met you were working with him since 2015, right? You yeah, we talking? toured together yeah. a while. We toured together a while ago and, and, and we definitely hit it off um, then. And then, you know, obviously we got to do Eyes Closed together and it's his first co-write. First time writing for another artist. Oh, cool. So I'm really happy that it was me. And that's um, a huge deal for him, too. Yeah. I, and it's cool, obviously, that you're the vessel for his words and you're yeah. the person he wants to give them to. It was really... Well, no, actually, I wrote all the lyrics. You did? Okay. He wrote all the melodies, yeah. Got so it, got it was it, another it. one of those situations where I wanted to get across a message and I thought his style would be the best way to do it. And that's what's so cool about music to me is if you listen to Eyes Closed, you can hear him. And he's mm-hmm. not on it, but you can hear him in the way it's sung. It has so much of his personality in it. That's cool. And that's what's so incredible mm-hmm. about music mm-hmm. and about writers, about songwriters. Mm-hmm. I, he- I heard him when I first listened to it. I was like, it sounds like a weekend type of song. Yeah. Well, it and sounds like a weekend record, yeah. yeah. But that's like when I hear Diamonds by Rihanna, I'm like, that's this is Sia. Yeah. This is yes. her. You know? You know. It's when people, when someone is a good writer, they have a style that is so distinct, a personality that shines through even when someone else is singing their words, mm-hmm. you know, and that is just, that is what's so powerful about music is, is the amount of personality, the language that it really is. You mentioned that you would you couldn't even imagine singing somebody else's words. Yeah. What do you call a singer who all their whole album is made up of? either barely co-writes or every record from everybody else? I think there's a couple of different ways to be an artist. I think that, you know, for an artist that's singing another person's words, they are, a, like you said, a vessel. Yeah. I think there's, I, I always say that there's three, there's three v- parts of being an artist. Um, 
there is to create, there is to perform, to execute, mm-hmm. and then there's some people who can do both. Yeah. Um, some people can write great music, but they're not great performers. Um, I think for a really long time I've thought that about myself. Um, and then I played 350 shows, and now I could do it in my Dude. sleep. <laughs> there you go. MSG, yeah. okay? Yeah, come so, on. <laughs> and I could do it in my in my sleep. But you know, and then there's some then there's some people who can evoke such an emotion when they're on stage, and they can just you know make everybody believe them and hang on to every word they're saying, even if they're singing something someone else wrote. Yeah. You know, and so I do think I think that there are facets of being an artist of there are facets of of music because there's two sides to it. There's people who create and people who execute, you know, and like I said, some people do both and that's awesome. But some some people don't. If you are, you know, like, for example, like and this is a w- weird, weird example to use. But like, you know, Beyonce is one of the greatest artists of our of human, human existence, you okay. know what I mean? And like, um, and, and you know, there's been times when she's taken songs people have written for her because they thought she'd be the best person, you know, to to demonstrate that, to execute that. And she can take a song someone else wrote and she can get on stage and she can sing it and make you feel yes. it in a way that the writer probably couldn't if they went out and did it. Um, and also sometimes writers are just shy. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes writers are just shy and they just don't want to don't want to go perform, you know. I think that that'll definitely be me at some point. One day? Yeah, I I just started writing like for other people recently. Um and I don't, there's nothing out yet. Um but I you know, I know some artists that are, you know, I've been talking about them them taking songs of mine and um it was really hard to do it first because I didn't want to give them up. I was yeah, like, "It's literally you." Yeah, it was really hard. I was yeah. like, "Oh," <laughs> but my album was done, and I was like writing these extras. songs, and I was like, <sighs> you know. And then people were like, I, "I want that song," and I'm like, "Okay," but like maybe I'll put it. Out. And my manager's like, "Ashley, you're not putting this song yeah, right. out. We have 16 <laughs> songs coming out. You're not putting you're this one out. Give it to them." Are and you I'm selective like, on who it goes to? Um, you know what? No. Okay. Um, I yes and no. I'm selective in the sense that I would never want someone who has a different moral code than me singing something. You know, like I would I would never want someone who's like homophobic or racist or something like that singing uh, something that I wrote that's so dear to me, um, just simply because I wouldn't want them exploiting, you know, Understood. my my emotions in that way. But I'm definitely not like an elitist by any means. Like if a new artist, like a young artist or like someone who maybe wasn't as popular, or, like isn't that song could change their life. Yeah. And also like who's to say that it doesn't mean just as much to them, if not more than it could to someone else, right. you know, if they can crush it, let them crush it. Um, so that's definitely definitely like, how I feel about about that. Cool. Is there anything negative about working with like Justin Bieber, the chain smokers? Because you see people commenting online and on Twitter saying Halsey's sold out or Halsey's gone mainstream. I mean, honestly, I I did an interview the other day and someone said something really funny to me. They called me a part time pop star, and I loved that. I thought that was really funny, uh-huh. um, part time pop star. Because you know the thing that people have to remember is that when the chain smokers or like Justin Bieber or someone ask me to feature on a song, they're doing it because they want a flavor or a personality or an element to the record that they're not bringing to it themselves Mm -hmm. and something that they see in my music and in my style that they want me to contribute to it in the same way that I did when I brought in Quavo or when I brought in Cashmere or Lauren, you know what I mean? Um, And so like for me, for me to go and, and bring my world you know, to another person's song. Like, that's meant to be collaborative. Also, I hate to make this <laughs> this kind of thing, but <laughs> when you're a female alternative artist, you have, like, this... Like, I'm, I'm my, making my fingers really small. You have <laughs> this much leeway. This much leeway. If you do one thing that is even slightly pop-leaning, all your alternative cred is gone. Mm-hmm. You're a pop star. Yeah. But, but, if you're Drake... You or your Kendrick everything. Lamar, you can feature on a Maroon 5 song mm-hmm. or a Sia song or a Taylor Swift song yep. or whatever, and you still get to maintain your urban cred, your rhythm cred. You still get to maintain your counterculture. No one's calling Drake a pop star. No one's calling Kendrick Lamar a pop star, even though they're doing pop records. So Kendrick has done a Maroon 5 feature, a Taylor Swift feature, and a Sia feature, which is more pop features than I've done, and no one's calling him a pop star. But I'm getting called one. 
even though I'm inherently an alternative artist. Well, Machine Gun Kelly's new album, he's got a lot of rock on there and nobody's calling him a rock star. They're calling him a rapper still. Yeah. I mean, I think that I don't know if it's a if it's a male thing. I don't know if it's an urban thing. I don't know, you know, what it is. But when you're a female alternative artist and you you do something that's even slightly pop leaning, it's just it's condemning. I mean, I talk about Lady Gaga all the time. The lengths that Lady Gaga has to go to to maintain her cred as like an artist oh, of the counterculture crazy. are insane. Because if she does one thing that's even slightly too pop, people are going to be like, wow, she sold out. She's a pop artist. So the lengths that she has to go to to maintain, no, I'm a part of the counterculture. I'm different. I'm, you know, I, I have my own lane. I have my own thing, whatever. The, you know, she has to wear raw meat. Like, yeah, right. you know what I mean? <laughs> like Kendrick Lamar can get on a Taylor Swift song and no one calls him a pop star. Lady Gaga has to wear raw meat. Yeah, right. <laughs> Like yep. you know, so it's like <laughs> it's 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 definitely a weird. Um, but does that influence your creative process, or you can't even you got to shut that out? Oh yeah, of you course you do. If I like a song, I'm gonna I'm gonna be a part of it. Yeah, yeah. I loved the feeling. The record I did with Justin Bieber, so good. I loved the feeling. So good. it was you know just such a special song and it really encompassed I think a part of my personality and a part of his that people really hadn't seen from him it was one of his first female features he had done with, with the exception of Nicki Minaj mm -hmm. you know what I mean um which was a really big deal for me um it's a life-changing record yeah absolutely it really is also you know and the cool thing for me and I hate having to say this but the cool thing for me is you know, I'm really glad I did the Bieber record, but I sold out Madison Square Garden before I did it. Cool. And I'm really no. glad that I did Closer, but Badlands went platinum before I did it. And I think so I've, I've worked really hard on my own, you know, and to have that handed to like someone else is, is like that. I won't, I won't tolerate that. Mm -hmm. Definitely won't tolerate that. Beautiful. Well, I, I was, I feel like I'm going to get the death stare for this one. No, no, no. But, um, <laughs> What's going on with me, you and Machine Gun Kelly? You spend a lot of time together. Yeah, we do. <laughs> um, <laughs> we met um, like a, a year and a half ago, I think. I don't know. We were doing a, a TV show together. Roadies, right? Called Roadies, a Cameron Crowe show. And we were playing Love Interest on the show. Um, and this is actually really funny. He, so we got our, each other's numbers before we did the show. I'd never met him before. And um, he was texting me a whole bunch asking me if I'd come over and rehearse with him because we were doing this song, my song Hold Me Down. We were doing like a strip version of it together on the show. And I broke my phone. So mm. I wasn't getting any of his texts. So I show up on set the next day and I'm nervous. I've never acted before and I'm in the makeup trailer. And he comes in and is just so mad at me. <laughs> He's like, I don't know who this girl thinks she is, making me look like a sucker out here, ignoring my text messages. Like, So he's like giving me like mean looks and he's in the makeup trail and he's sitting, I'm like, hey, I'm Ashley, you know what I mean? He's like, yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, whoa, that's how this guy's gonna be. Today's gonna suck, oh my God, I don't wanna do this at all. I have to play his love interest? This guy's a jerk, I hate this. And so, um, so we, uh, I'm like, okay, like, so, like, are you excited for today? And he's like, yeah, like, I texted you, though, like, and you didn't, but you didn't answer me. So, like, I, I hope the performance goes good. Like, we didn't rehearse. And I'm like, uh, yeah, I hope it goes good. What? You texted me? Like, <laughs> dude, my, phone, my phone was broken. And it took about six minutes. And um, it was 10 in the morning. It took about six minutes to go from us hating each other to us like drinking Jack Daniels and like cool. doing our scene and we really hit it off um and uh I mean we definitely we've definitely spent a lot of time together since and I played him my record when I first got it and he played me his when he first had it done uh, we were in Mexico mm -hmm. and Are you exchanging um, notes does he give you thoughts yeah of course we, of course I mean he's he I have, I have so much respect for him because he's always done exactly what he wants to do sure has always does exactly what he wants to do um and doesn't care really doesn't care what people think as long as he's proud of his art mm -hmm. um and it shows and, and, and I always say that the mark of a really good artist, the mark of a timeless artist, the mark of an iconic artist is someone who puts out music that only they could sing. Yeah. When you hear a record and you're like, damn, only Beyonce could do that. No one else could do that. Or you hear a record and you're like, literally no one but but Rihanna could sing that song. Or like, wow, like like 21 yeah. Pilots. No. Yeah. Like, who else is going to sing a Nobody. 21 Pilots song? No one. No. Tyler Joseph. That's it. And I feel that way about a lot of songs on his new record, on Bloom. Yeah. And, and I think that's really, really... It's it's so mature and it's it's a lot of a lot of growth for him. 
um, we'll probably do a song together eventually, I think. Do you see yourself ideally settling down with an artist when the time is right? Um, I, I think it would uh, it would depend. Uh, I think I would have to because no one else would be able to tolerate. Understand <laughs> my like craziness. All of I'll tell it. you what though, I do I do bug him all the time though because I'm like a, I'm a, I'm an artist manager. Like, I'm not just an artist. Yeah. I'm, like, so involved in, like, the business side of, like, the things that I do. do so I'm constantly, like, all right, so what's your schedule and where are you going to be on Friday and when's your flight and when are you flying? And he's, like, <laughs> Ash, like, I don't know. Leave me alone. I just want to, like, play guitar. Like, that's all I want to do. And I'm, like, well, I need to know this and what do you need and then what time's your call time and are you doing the red carpet? And I'm, like, you know what I mean? I'm uh -huh. so obnoxious. So if I did settle down with an artist, I would need to be with someone that, like, was could like handle me trying to manage trying yeah, to manage be a us. momager yeah exactly <laughs> like trying to manage manage our relationship i would have an eye cal for everything That's like, funny. for dinner <laughs> yeah hopeless fountain kingdom is the second album from halsey it's coming out june 2nd a lot of love for you 16 songs Thank a lot guys. by the way Woo, i know yeah. i know and i tried to cut it down too didn't work did it no it did not she had work. to give some away yeah <laughs> yeah i mean it had to be it had to be 16 yeah. songs i said when i started the album actually i said this is gonna be a 10 song album 10 track album short sweet to the point and then i was done and was like nope yeah. never mind <laughs> it's not well, how much six. can i get away with yeah. well we also didn't, we didn't talk about the album i mean the uh tour but we're out of time but, but you yeah, do have a headlining tour. tour with charlie xcx and party next door it's In your second fall. arena tour yep it hits this fall Congratulations. Thank you so much, guys. I just want to bring everyone the best show I can and, you know, take them into my world a little bit and let them see what the Elba Swan Kingdom is all about in the, in the best way I know how, and that's live. I'm excited to see it. Yeah. And I, I'm excited to see the album come to life. Yeah, so, same. Thank you, guys. Love for you. Thank, thank you so much you. for Love taking the too. time. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.